Hello everyone. As promised, I will record uh, some notes and some thinking about concurrency in, in Golang. Um, I have a mentee, but obviously you cannot participate because this is just a static video. But nevertheless, uh, it will be used uh, as sort of a reference for me and I will link it in the lecture notes in the wiki. All right, so let's start. Of course, you cannot ask any questions. <clears throat> there are some quizzes and uh, the first one is what is the difference between uh, concurrency and parallelism? So let's see if the if that quiz works not really i don't think well it works but it's kind of pointless um so is concurrency the same as parallelism no it's not uh parallelism refers to actually physically doing something at the same time whereas concurrency describes a mechanism for pretending of doing certain things at the same time, but letting the runtime system and the processors to decide how much can actually be done in parallel and how much can be, you know, um, simulated. So to demonstrate uh, the, the difference, uh, imagine that we have some task, whoops, not circle. Uh, where are the squares? Yeah. So imagine that we have some some processing happening from left to right, uh, and imagine that we have uh, three things to do. Uh, the last one being kind of the longest. So uh, if we executing uh, things, if we executing things um, sequentially, uh, let me just delete. How uh, you delete from here? No, don't start over. Yeah, I guess just select and you delete. All right. So, um, if we have effectively time flowing from left to right, uh, and we start the processing here, uh, then the first function will take certain amount of time. Then we do the second function, and then the third function, um, kind of finishes our processing and we are sort of done around that time. So the total time which we consume on a single CPU will be yay long. Um, if we have a modern computing architecture with four cores and uh, core multi-threading, often two or four, uh, we end up with four or eight physical run uh, processors so we can do what we can do is we can say we want to run the first function on the first processor and then we can take oops sorry oh i lost the second function uh we can take the second one and do on the on second processor and we can let me duplicate that and take this one, delete this one. So if we do this, we start all three tasks at the same time uh, and kind of finish when the last one, um, last task needs to finish. So we can benefit if those tasks, of course, can happen uh, concurrently, right? Uh, or in parallel. Um, sometimes the tasks themselves are a little bit more complicated because they may require certain synchronization. So imagine that our second task cannot start until the first one is done. So that means the second only can start after the first one is done. So even if we schedule the second one on a second CPU, uh, that means it will still need to wait until the synchronization point and then it can actually run. So then we will finish at that point. Uh, so depending on the internal synchronization between the tasks and how they need to operate, uh, we can uh, you know, obtain a certain performance uh, benefits. So if we think about it, um, 
parallelism is when things really happen at the same time and concurrency is when things are emulated to happen on this at the same time but actually we use a single cpu to pretend to us that certain things are kind of a sharing resources so um if we imagine that we only have one cpu uh, and we want to emulate par par concurrency on those three tasks um, of course this one and this one will have to be simulating happening at the same time whereas this one is waiting until the synchronization point and then this one and this one needs to be happening at the same time so how the cpu does it well the cpu uses context switching and it will um it will do a little bit of the first task and then it will stop and it will say okay i will context switch to the second task and it will kind of start doing the second task and it will stop and then it will come back to this one and continue and stop and then continue and stop and continue and stop continue and stop and so on and those are kind of um, context switching places where the cpu the single cpu is switching between doing the task one uh and task three right um uh, so depending on how many cpus we have on the architecture um the concurrency or the parallelism will occur uh, but concurrency is the way of expressing what can happen at the same time and then if we do have the resources if we do have uh cpu uh cpu3 then um this and this tasks can be happening at the same time physically uh, because we told the architecture that yes those are independent they can be happening at the same time if we have uh, cpu2 even if we have cpu2 and cpu1 uh, these two even if this job is sort of scheduled on cpu2 will have to wait um, all right so if we go back here uh, the basic uh, premise is that concurrency is possible on a single CPU, parallelism requires hardware support, uh, and concurrency is a way of expressing what can happen in parallel uh, or what can happen concurrently. Alright, so um, the second question is about concurrency in Go, uh, and the uh, answer to that question is that the concurrency primitives are built in into the language itself. So it's not a standard li library, although some of the mechanisms are part of the standard library, like atomics and um, mutexes, for example. Um, but some aspects of concurrency are part of the language itself, and I will uh, show you in a, in a minute what I mean. Uh, so why do we use concurrent programming uh, in general? You can pause the video and, and think a little bit. Uh, why do you think concurrent programming is beneficial? So, well, it has some advantages. So everything that we have outside of the computer is pretty much concurrent. There is a lot of activities that happen at the same time. Um, so we have to deal with this outside world complexity somehow. Um, users may initiate certain activities and they may not want to wait for the result of that activity, but may want to be able to do some other things at the same time. So they may, for example, decide to upload data to somewhere and at the same time continue reading some uh, article or something you know uh, at the same time right so while the in the background we are having some uh, file uploading or file downloading maybe we have some music player going on uh, we want to give the user uh, ability to interact with this uh, with the system um, through multiple means IO, of course. So, for example, if we make a network request, we may need to wait for the data to come back to us. Uh, at that at that time, we can do something else. Uh, file system, database access, 
uh, they all can happen, uh, or physics updates in, in games, they all can happen while the user is interacting with some buttons or doing something else. So our program needs to be able to deal with that. It's also a very useful abstraction to deal with uh, agency of certain processes or demons. Uh, and of course, most modern architectures have more than a single CPU. So if you want to take advantage of that, uh, you have to do concurrent programming. Uh, otherwise, your, your logic will not be able to take the, the benefit of the underlying platform. Uh, especially in the server environments, uh, some of the modern CPUs have a massive amount of cores and massive amount of physical threading that is possible. So then concurrency is beneficial uh, to gain uh, performance benefits from that, from the underlying platform. Um, so what do we use for concurrency in programming? What sort of construct constructs? Uh, again, you can think a little bit about it. And the answer to this question probably comes, sorry, the, the answer to this question probably comes from the background that you already have and from the languages that you've used so far. So if you're coming from C uh, or C++ background, you're probably familiar with threads, uh, with mutexes, and maybe with atomics. Uh, atomics and threading has been added to C um, in the recent update. And uh, some of the primitives exist in modern C++. So you often think in terms of threads and some primitives to synchronize uh, threading. Uh, in Golang, uh, we talk about goroutines and channels. Uh, those are kind of uh, two primitives which are building into the language. Uh, on top of those two, you have uh, mutexes and atomics which you can use. Uh, they are implemented as part of the standard library, uh, but they are sort of like any other standard library. Uh, they are external functions that you use to manipulate mutexes and atomics, whereas goroutines and channels are part of the language itself, which is quite unique uh, because in many languages, like as I mentioned before, C, C++, uh, you have threads mutexes and atomics and are all implemented as part of sort of standard library support. Uh, whereas in, uh, in Golang, those first two are part of the language. All right, so uh, let's, let's have a look on how these uh, primitives work in practice. And we will start with the ones which are part of the standard library, actually. Uh, so we will start with mutexes and atomics. Um, to demonstrate a very simple um, use case, uh, we will have <coughs> we will have a, a simple sim simple function func, uh, which adds. Um, let me just delete that. We not need this, and we don't need this yet. Um, so we will do. Let me save that. Um, so what is happening in the code? All right, so um, in the code, we have a very simple function which adds one to a global counter. We have a global counter, uh, a global variable, and this function, when called, um, adds one to this. And then uh, to simulate a little bit of a delay, we sleep for uh, 50 milliseconds. And here we run this function for um, thousand times, uh, which means we will wait for about five seconds before everything happens. And then we're hoping for the counter to be uh, 1000 uh, because we will kind of add to zero thousand times plus one, which means the counter should end up uh, being uh, 1000. So let me run it and let's see if it does what, yeah, let's do this. So what we are printing, um, one thing that we print is how many CPUs do we have, uh, how many uh, physical CPUs we have. And uh, as you see 
on my current platform i have four and all cpus are two there are two um, hardware threads so in fact i can run eight concurrent jobs at the same time um the loop is happening so we're waiting thousand times for uh 50 milliseconds which uh, should let me see yeah we're doing that we're doing that we're measuring the time so that should be five times yeah i i did one zero mistake so uh 50 times thousand is actually 50 seconds um that's a little bit long to wait uh but uh let's change it to let's change it to something smaller so we will just wait five milliseconds that will be five seconds thousand times right so that will work uh the number total number is thousand uh and let's rerun it such that we will uh see that it really takes five seconds excellent so that sort of works um and what we can do is we can um in the forever loop we will run this um we will run it for a while so we kind of repeating the the test um forever and we sort of are watching how long it takes and how what is our counter so we see we're taking a little bit over um five we're wasting some time on bootstrapping the the entire process and then we um adding the numbers and we getting we getting the results and it sort of looks that everything works fine so let me stop that um, and let's reduce the time let's not wait any time at all and let's run it again and this time the processing takes a really small small number of time uh, and the number is very nicely thousand we have no hiccups right so everything works so now what we can do is we can redo this and instead of redoing this test let me just print uh processing time and add this new line character so we will redo it and this time around we will run the processing this this function in a single thread separate thread so we're running thousand threads each of those individual threads will uh add one uh and then we will um yeah this one is uh, doesn't want to stop let's see i did stop it but it buffered the printouts and it will kind of go on for a while all right so to make this this line of code uh run concurrently uh there is a go keyword which is called go uh, and that's all you need to run a function in a separate thread, so to say. It's not really running a, a function in a separate thread. Uh, the runtime system decides whether it really needs a separate thread or whether it should use the existing thread and, and use some uh, pooling of the, of the resources. But that's the, um, the entire uh, keyword that, that you need. So I will have to kill... Uh, my IntelliJ because it's sort of apparently okay maybe it stopped maybe it looked like I clicked stop but it didn't really stop all right so uh, it seems that it stopped now uh, so let's let's rerun it uh, maybe this forever loop is a little bit risky so let's run it for uh, 10 times so I'll run it for uh for a number in a range of 10. Yeah, let's do that.
Let's see. Yeah, I don't really need that, right? Perfect. So let's run it 10 times this time. Whoa, so it happened uh, very quickly. Uh, the processing time, it used to be around, um, let me see one more time without this. Let's rerun it with the, you see it's one microsecond. So the processing time of adding thousand numbers, uh, it's very fast. If we do this, it's uh much slower so it's um you know a uh, hundred to three hundred times slower uh and our numbers don't end up right we don't have thousand anymore uh why we don't have thousand well we don't have thousand because this operation even though it looks kind of atomic and unique uh and one line operation they're just incrementing a global counter uh it is actually composed out of three operations. Um, the first operation is reading the value out of the variable. Uh, so that's, we have to, we have to do three things. Um, so first we have to read the value. Then we have to increment, increment the value. And then we have to reassign new value, right? So this line, is actually composed of three things. And because we're not doing any synchronization, at any point when these three things are happening, different threads are competing for incrementing that value, right? Remember, we have thousands of them. Um, so if one is reading the value and read the current value, which is zero, and start incrementing it, but hasn't finished that incrementation yet, or maybe it finished, but haven't reassigned it, and another one is reading the value, the value is still zero, right? The value will change only after the first thread gets to here, uh, the, the value got reassigned. So that's why we're missing some values because a lot of threads were reading like, you know, zero or some value which subsequently got incremented, but was not incremented yet. Uh, so we kind of see that it's not thousand. Uh, we, we are missing some some values. That's probably not uh, it, the the one is probably from here, from uh, the the third decimal place. Um, so we to fix that, we have to um, synchronize this line, uh, and we can synchronize this line using either mutex, or we can synchronize this line using atomics. And the solution that is implemented here is using atomics. So if we, instead of this line, we say we are incrementing this global variable by one in an atomic fashion, uh, such that those three operations are actually done in a transaction. So while this function is doing those three things, no other um operation will um manipulate the state of this global variable so the first caller who starts incrementing the value will block any other subsequent callers until those three are atomically finished right um so we keep the go uh we rerun it 10 times again and we see if our solution is fixed um and we see that is not fixed. We're still missing some, some values. Uh, so what do you think? Atomics are broken? Um, well, not really. Uh, it has to do with the way Golang works. So the way Golang works is it starts the main and it starts doing everything in a single thread. So it prints that line. So we have this line here. Uh, prints uh, how many processors we have. And then it goes into the loop and starts doing this uh, 10 times this loop, right? So it starts the first iteration, it checks the clock to calculate the time, starts spawning the thousand um, processes, uh, goes in here and checks what is the current uh, status of the global variable. Uh, and at that point, 
not all the threads finished yet. Uh, so it checks the status, but you know, some of the threads are still processing and it goes into deadline. It loops through, it keeps looping 10 times. And then when it hits the final iteration, it quits. So it stops the main thread. Uh, and even though there were running threads, uh, the main thread finishes and that, it, that is it. Um, so to really demonstrate that the atomics kind of correctly worked, we have to, at this point, before we print the total, we have to wait for all the threads that have been started with this line to finish. Um, and to do that, it's relatively straightforward in, uh, in Golang. Uh, what we will do is we will use a concept of a work group. And a work group is a single, simple uh, counter which accumulates kind of like how many jobs are running. And then you can block until all of them this declare that they are done. So the way it works is you declare a variable and you call it a wait group. And then when you're spawning your threads, you will say, well, um, I have another job. So when you spawning a new uh, coroutine, a go routine, uh, you're saying, well, the work group is, you know, more uh, one more because I'm starting now a, an extra thread, right? Uh, and then at this uh, point, at this point, uh, this is not needed. At this point, before I print the the value, I have to say wait, wait for all the go routines to tell me that they are finished. Uh, and when they are finished, well, they are finished when they're hitting this bracket. So. I can have a call here, but to call this, I have to pass um, WG. So uh, sync wait group um, to be able to do this. Um, it is okay to do it this way. It is a little bit nicer if you say, if you say at the beginning that you defer defer do done such that you are guaranteed that it will happen no matter what right uh, why why what was the difference between doing it like this and doing it like this well if i have some form of exception if i panic or do something in the middle then this line will never be called but if i do it this way uh this line will always be called no matter what happens in the middle here. Uh, so it's a little bit better practice to kind of defer things that has to happen uh, when you hit this bracket uh, to, uh, to be called by uh, this kind of a defer uh, statement. So then we are saying, well, we will be done when we add this number and then uh, we have to pass um, Come on, work keyboard, uh, WG here, but we are passing the reference. Excellent. So now if we rerun it, uh, we will see that the times didn't improve, but we have a very nice uh, thousands everywhere, which means our synchronization works and the number is calculated correctly. So, um, well, as you see, we didn't benefit it much from parallelism, right? From our four CPUs. So let's reintroduce this delay and let's check how fast this works. So without the delay, it was in a range of 500 milliseconds, uh, 500 microseconds. Uh, if we re reintroduce the delay, and rerun it, uh, you see it still is in the range of 500 micro microseconds. Nothing really changed, right? Nothing really changed in our parallel implementation with Go routines uh, doing this uh, simple task of incrementing a global counter and waiting five uh, milliseconds every, every thread. Uh, our total time uh, is for doing this thousand iterations is pretty much kind of constant. It's around uh, 500, 600 microseconds. 
what will happen if I remove this go, if I do it sequentially without the concurrency? Well, we will unfortunately have to wait five seconds because this thousand tasks done concurrently are only occupying the time that it takes to spawn all those threads. But running the threads, running this addition is super fast and, you know, it roughly takes around um, five milliseconds per, per thread. Um, whereas here, without those Go routines, uh, everything is done sequentially and the total time for doing that, uh, you know, takes five seconds per iteration, which means doing 10 iterations is going to take um, 1000 seconds. All right. So that is sort of uh, a longish discussion about synchronization and atomics. Uh, you can revert back to um, an atomics is sort of in this particular case, it's the uh, the easiest and the most natural way of solving this, this trivial uh, task. Um, if we were to implement it uh, using, uh, so I will not delete that, I will keep it, but we will go back to unsafe call with the, uh, so unsafe, uh, this one is with atomics. And this one is remember to say you're done. All right. And then what we can do is we can use the mutex solution. Uh, mutex solution is basically the same as this one. So we are operating on the unsafe um, kind of um, operation. But before we do that operation, uh, which is inherently unsafe because it's doing those three things, we have to obtain a mutex. So again, uh, what we can do is we can have, uh, you, normally you should probably pass the, the mutex here. So uh, let's, let's say sync uh, mutex. Let's not have global variables beyond what we really need. Uh, and then what we will do is we will say mu lock. And when we are done, we will say mu unlock. Again, uh, because we're doing this unlocking and we don't want to have deadlocks, this typically should be done in defer. So refactor to defer. Uh, I will show you how to do that because that's also quite a nice pattern. Uh, we already have something to do in defer, right? And we don't really want to defer twice because that's um, that's not good because uh, the last one which you are deferring is actually the one which is being called. So what, what, what you will do is, what you can do is you can have a lambda which is like an empty, empty function and you define everything that needs to be uh, needs to be done here. So we want to tell the work group that we are done and we also have to say to a mutex that we are unlocking, right? So this, this is done, uh, done in defer, right? And then here we locking, we incrementing and then automatically we will unlock. Um, and when we do this, we need this uh, variable here. So mutex sync mutex, and then we will pass an extra thing, which is a mutex. And then we will rerun it. So now we are doing an unsafe operation, but we guaranteeing that only one thread at a time will be doing that unsafe operation and it will be unlocking. Um, you will notice that the unlocking happens after the sleep, right? So actually, because majority of the weight can, like other resources can be already adding numbers while we sleeping, uh, actually it might be better to keep it here instead of doing it in a defer, even though it's sort of a little bit unsafe. 
right? But that means we're releasing the lock on this resource as soon as we're done, such that while we're sleeping, other threats can be adding numbers, right? Uh, so maybe we should do, um, maybe we should do that. Um, right, let's test this. Ah, oh, yeah, I didn't do in parallel. So our mutexes don't really do much because we need to spawn all the threats. So let's let me spawn all the threats. Let's stop this, rerun it. Um, right, so there is um, a problem and who knows, who can see the bug? So we see like uh, with the mutex, it takes a little bit faster, maybe, uh, than the atomics. Uh, but we have some screw up, like we have, we don't have thousands anymore. Uh, so where is the bug? Well, the bug is that we're passing the mutex by value. And every time we're calling this function, it's a new mutex and it's locked. But, you know, it doesn't mean that the next call, the next thread, which is doing that function is using the same mutex. It's actually a different mutex. So what we need to do is we need to pass a handle to a mutex and we need to say we want this to be passed by reference instead. Let's test if that hypothesis work. Yes, it worked. So we have bug fixed. We solved our concurrency bug and we can see that uh, the numbers are square and round as thousand. And as you can see, again, it takes about 200, 300 microseconds to do this. Uh, the, the, the problem is not really with the, with the efficiency of atomics or uh, mutexes. The biggest our problem, the, the slowdown is in spawning the threats. Like spawning the threats takes certain amount of time. Uh, and then in, in this case, it's around um, uh, 0 0.2 nanoseconds, right? Because we're doing thousand of them. So if we cro uh, move the uh, decimal place uh, three, three left, uh, we know how much per, th per spawn on average it takes. So it's, it's around um, uh, uh, 0.3 nanosecond. Uh, and that is the cost of bootstrapping this. But then if your functions take a little bit of time, then you have huge benefits, right? As we see from the, uh, from rerunning it with just the, uh, sequential operation. It's like square five seconds of wait uh, because of, of the time it sort of do do the processing. Um, all right, so you kind of learned two uh, mechanisms of, uh, of doing the um, of doing the synchronization. And there is the third one. The third one is with channels. Um, and what are channels? Well, you have to think about channels as sort of like a pipe to which uh, one process or one producer pushes something in and another one consumes something on the on the other end. Uh, and the channels have um, kind of a nice uh, syntax in the, in the language. So I will, um, yeah, let's uh, have another function. So func channel add. So when you, um, okay, so show me here a type. So let, let me have a variable C, which is a channel. Uh, and then uh, you're using kind of a, a, um, a chan um, a keyword and you're declaring uh, what is, uh, what direction this variable allows you to interact with the channel. Is it like putting data in or consuming data out of the channel? Um, so let me check. So what what the C when when you declare C uh, and you say uh, C is a channel of int, uh, you can say uh, a, a C. Um, yeah, so. Well, uh, we have to do it in the function actually. So let's pass a parameter. 
um, and then if you do it like this, it means uh, C is a channel, bidirectional channel. You can put data into the channel and you can read data out of the channel. Uh, to read data from the channel, so if I want to read data from the channel, I would just say this. Uh, and that construct reads data from the channel. Uh, if I want to put something into the channel, uh, I would uh, I would use C and put data into the channel. So you're using this kind of an arrow uh, to indicate if data is flowing into the channel or if data is flowing uh, out of the channel, right? Uh, if you don't want uh, to allow, so if I say like this, uh, if you want to not allow uh, reading from the channel, but only writing, then you say you can on C can only write into the channel. And then this line would not work because you cannot read from the channel. If you not, if you want to not allow re uh, writing from the channel, but only reading, you do an arrow here. Uh, so you kind of declare that C can only read. Uh, let me see what it complains. Uh, yeah, so that uh, I have to assign it. I'm reading from the channel and sorry, and I'm kind of assigning it to data, right? Um, unused variable, yeah. So this operation reads an integer from the channel and then I'm assigning it to data. Uh, this operation, uh, this operation writes into the channel and you have to have some sort of data to be passed into the channel, right? Um, yeah, so you see, I, I said this channel is read only uh, and you cannot uh, put data into the channel because it's read only. If I delete that, then it will be okay. Uh, so how can we do this um, add one to a global thing? Uh, and by the way, when you have when you use atomics, atomics don't have some they have some primitive methods, but they only also allow you to use uh, atomics on a struct. Uh, so for example, if the global thing, if the global variable is a struct, you can also use kind of an atomic wrapper around manipulating and updating the st state of the struct as well. Okay, so with, with the channels, um, we have to model our problem a little bit differently now uh, because we have a global number, which is uh, kind of a global variable, uh, but we have it as uh, in 32 uh, and we will be adding uh, value. Um, we, we kind of, I don't want to uh, redo this function. I want to keep it in the in the source code so you can have a uh, look later how it looks like. So I'm going to redo this line, but uh, with chan at instead. So we'll run kind of a multiple threads with chan at, uh, and then we will um, uh, demonstrate how the synchronization happens with channels. So what we will do is, we will have kind of a bidirectional channel, uh, and we will uh, read. Uh, we will read data. We'll read data from the channel, and the channel is int thirty two, so same as the original problem. Uh, and data is int thirty two. I don't want to declare it. I want to do it in one line. So I will say data is this. And then what I will do is I will say uh, data plus one. I will do this kind of an unsafe, unsafe adder. Uh, and then I will push this new data into the channel, right? So read from channel and write into channel, write back. All right, so then to write back, we will just say we're writing data back into the channel. Uh, this is our function. Again, for the sake of similarity, we will sleep uh, same amount of time. So 
let me sleep. And then uh, what we will need in main is we will not need any of that, uh, what we currently have. Uh, we will also do it 10 times, but this time around, instead of calling, so we don't need to call this. And we don't need to call this. We don't. Do we need to sync? Yes, we need to sync. So we, instead of calling this, we will say add, no, chan. Chan add, and we need to have a channel. Uh, so we declare a channel of var. We have our chan. A chan is a bad name. Um, data channel. It's um, let's not declare it. Let's define it, and we say make channel of int thirty two. So we have our channel ready, and we will. Pass it as uh, uh, pass it by reference. I think by value. I am pretty sure channels will work by value. So we don't need mutex anymore because we're not using it. Uh, we using our channels. We can't. We waiting for all the channels for all these calls. To this function to finish, but we have no synchronization, and we have kind of a unsafe adder here. Uh, the synchronization happens because of the channel itself, right? So we have no atomics and we have no mutexes. Uh, we only reading and writing into a channel. Uh, we sleeping the same amount of time, uh, and we rerunning it uh, ten times with currently without um, spawning the go routines. So. Uh, that should take, um, we have some problems. Yes, we have problems because we're waiting here and we should not be waiting because we don't have go routines going on. So I will comment that one, those things out. Let's try again. Um, Right, right, right. Okay, that wasn't a problem. Uh, the problem is that we... Yeah, so th this is not a problem. We should be... We can do that. Um, we have to pass a work group, of course, to our method. And we have to say the same as here, that we are done when we are done. All right, so that is the same, but we are missing one more thing. So work group uh, sync wait group wait group. Okay, um, not that symbol, the star. All right, so uh, what are we missing? Well, we missing the fact that this this function is gonna block here and wait for somebody to write into the channel first. And we haven't written to channel anywhere uh, because our global variable has not been put into that channel yet. So what we have to do is we have to say data channel and we have to write our global, global number, right? Um, our global number is a reference. So we need to extract the value out of it. So what, what happens is we're reading the value out of our global variable and we're putting in, shoveling it into that channel. Uh, when we are done and all the uh, things has have, have happened, uh, we need to read the global number back. So we have to say the global number is now whatever is left in the channel. Uh, so we will do, what was the channel called? Data channel. And we need to assign that. All right, so now we have this initial write. Then we spawn the, the readers and writers. And then we have the final read. Uh, once everybody has confirmed that they are done. So let's let's rerun it. Um, we still... Um, 
we still have a deadlock uh, and the deadlock is why we uh, yeah so channels probably have to be passed by reference um, let's see where is our channel I don't think so the channels should work the way I did it so what is what we are missing so after fiddling with this for a while uh, yep I mean uh, concurrent programming is hard um, I have it working so there is um, some interplay between the synchronization through the workgroups and synchronization through the channels. Um, so with this function that we're using <clears throat> for communicating the value through the data channel, uh, we're basically doing the same logic. Um, but we need a little bit of a synchronization. We have to tell the main loop when all those workers are done. Uh, and to do that, we have additional channel where we basically push um, true value when we're done. So after passing the data into the data channel, we also pass true to the kind of communication coordination channel. Uh, and then we will know that all workers are done when we consume all those uh, tokens from the, from the uh, coordination channel. There are different ways of doing this. This is just one way of knowing when all the threads has has been finished. Um, so this is kind of the one important aspect. The other one is in our main um, flow, uh, everything that we do with channels has to happen in root Go routines. We cannot really manipulate things in the main thread because the moment the main thread has a call to a channel, uh, so let's say I'm trying to read the, the value out of the data channel. Um, so if I have a call like this, um, and the main thread notices that there are no more Go routines running, this, this will panic. So this will throw an exception saying, well, all the threads are asleep or are like finished, and then we should not be, you know, reading from a channel. Uh, so if all the uh, readings from the channel we have to do in Go routines, that's why the initialization is kind of moved into the setup. So we have just a function which reads the global variable and pushes it into a channel. Um, and we can run this behavior in a Go routine. So here, and then for the finishing, we basically have the same uh, logic. So uh, we reading from the data channel, assigning it to a global number, and then we also writing true that we finished finishing uh, into the coordination channel. So all of those things happen in Go routines. So notice that I have to prefix everything with Go such that I'm not doing anything in the kind of a main thread in relation to the uh, to manipulation of the data through the channels. I'm only spawning everything and coordinating when to finish. So then uh, when to finish, uh, we again, we spawning all those uh, thousand uh, workers. They will kind of run in their own threads here. Uh, and then when we should finish, well, we have to consume all this finished um, bulls. So we will have 1000 finished bulls plus this one, which is injected in our finish function. So we will have thousand plus one. So I have another go routine where I'm consuming in a loop all those thousand finish. Uh, so in, in, in this loop, we are consuming all the booleans, reading them from the coordination channel. And when we finish reading 1000, we have to read one more and then we're done. So when this go routine is done, it communicates to our main thread and main thread is waiting for this go routine to finish, to basically finish. And then when this happens, we are done. Uh, so when we run this, uh, you will see, okay, let's run it again. Um, 
you will see that it works, but it works sometimes. Sometimes it blows up. So let me let me compile again. So I will build it and I will run it. And it works. It works. It works. It works. And it blows up. All right. The beauty of concurrent programming. So most of the time it works. Sometimes it blows up. Why? Well, it has to do, as I said, with the reading and writing into channels from the main thread. So as we spawning all those go routines, we, we notice we have one uh, thousand and then one more and then one more. The order in which they are spawned matters because if we spawn some of them ahead of the other ones, we will end up in a situation where some of those go routines are trying to read from a channel and none of the routines are started yet to write into the channel, right? So for example, if this setup go routine, the one which writes the initial value into the, the channel is not started before these ones are started, then we'll have a problem because these guys are trying to read from the channel, but there is no go routine which is currently writing or running to write into the channel. And then it will kind of complain. It will say, uh, we have some problems. Um, let me see. Um, so it complains. Uh, yeah, so it, it says, well, um, we have a problem. Everything is asleep or we have a deadlock. And what it means is that we have in line 16, we are waiting for reading here for reading from the data channel but there are no go routines yet which has been spawned to write into it right so as you as you observe this sequence uh, spawning this has to happen before we spawn this and most of the time it does uh, but sometimes it doesn't so if this spawning is delayed by the runtime system and this spawning happens before we blow up and that happens sometimes most of the time the initialization is done on time but sometimes it's not so what it means is we would need to introduce additional synchronization here to make sure that this is done like uh, the setup is done before we start uh doing that right um well, one way of doing it is basically to move um, this. Whoops, let me copy that. So we could move this um, into the setup. And then we will be sure that the re writing into C has happened before we're doing the loop. So, but that would require me to be passing into the setup the data channel and the finished channel for coordination. So I can do that. So end channel, that one is we have a channel for reading or writing, yeah, both. And it's a Boolean values. And C is, Right, so that needs to be mute now uh, bidirectional as well. Okay, so let's see if I rebuild this. Um, dun, 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 why I have not updated the call. So I need finished. All right, so let's check if it builds. Well, it builds, but it blows up big time. Let me double check. It's easier to run from the command line because I can quickly redo the commands multiple times. Yes, it continuously blow up because um, now it's possible that my finish is too early. Like this one happens after finish start reading from the finished channel. And it says, well, look, I don't have any go routines which are writing to my finish, so um, I'm blowing up, right? So again, this one would need to happen, like uh, the finishing needs to happen after um, 
the the setup is happening so i will revert back i like this um this setup better even though it's not entirely correct and even though it requires additional synchronization for spawning spawning things um yeah so that should be it this one it needs to be sorry this one needs to be here so we're reading the final value from finished and we cannot read directly from the channel we basically need to spawn we spawning no we're not spawning we're doing uh wait so we have the finishing here then we are waiting for all the finishing we need to say at one right uh let's see right so that works uh as i said it works most of the time but sometimes it will blow up depending how the yeah so it works most of the time but it's still not entirely correct but the not entirely correct part is in the way that those go routines are actually initialized like you know we're writing that code in sequence but of course it's not being executed in sequence the moment we we say go the control goes to the next line and that you know concurrently to us doing those lines this line is being executed and sometimes this line is behind those lines or sometimes those lines are behind the finish and so on and then you end up with this situation of you trying to read from the channel and there are, there are no threads yet in, in instantiated uh, such that um, uh, you have this detected deadlock um, so one more uh one uh, a couple of additional comments so one comment is that those readings from the channels are blocking um the reason why they are all blocking is um so the reading when you have nothing in the channel of course it will block but the writing are also blocking so this call is blocking here until there is another thread, another go routine somewhere which tries to read from the channel. Uh, otherwise, this one waits for another go routine to be available to write. Uh, and this is the, the, this is exactly what I was talking about with the deadlock situation. So the kind of uh, a nice way of solving this is to say that sometimes there is a race condition between some of those initialization and because of that what you could do is you could increase the size of the channel so if you if you initialize initiate your channels like this they are of zero buffer there is no buffer and every write operation blocks until there is a read uh, an equivalent read somewhere uh, to unblock but if you say i will have uh, a size one or size 10 that means you have a buffer and then 10 consecutive writes will happen until the system sort of complains that there are no threads uh, currently reading from that from the channel so uh, if you do this you're introducing kind of a, a buffer into your channels such that concurrent threads uh concurrent go routines those are not threads the thre threads are, are, are different construct um concurrent go routines can write into the channel uh even though there are no uh necessary go routines reading from it until the buffer is exhausted and then the next one the 11th one will block or complain if there are no consumers right so if if we run that um yeah that that uh blows up again sometimes when we exceed the you know the uh the writers sometimes are not the problem the problem are the readers so if the reader starts too early and tries to read and the buffer is empty anyway like there were no writers writing to it uh then it will it will blow up right um so to go around this you uh you would need to think how to prevent 
this finishing to happen before these two are kind of started and you can uh, you can do that by um, introducing this additional uh, work uh, work group primitives by passing them into the the setup and waiting until the setup is kind of done and then waiting until like you can put the whole loop into a, a go routine and then wait until uh, the loop initiate initiates everybody and then um, do the finish after um, so yeah I don't want to drag it too long I've, I've been already going for an hour uh, as we were going through um, the, the fundamental aspect is go routines and channels it is a little bit tricky uh, sometimes it makes perfect sense and uh, the, the usefulness of channels are obvious uh, if you have um, relatively complex um, workers and passing data from uh, some workers in, in a kind of a pipeline. Uh, in some cases, uh, it's just easier to use um, uh, atomic updates or mutexes. Um, and as we've been experiencing in this very simple test code, the mutex was sort of the fastest but also a little bit more verbose the atomic was the sort of the easiest um, and the simplest and then the channels the go routines with channels they are a little bit slow and also a little bit more complex in terms of arranging how things happen and you have to remember that you cannot do things in the main thread because the, mo the moment you start reading without having some go routines being supplying the necessary um, values, it will it will blow up. Um, one way of thinking about it is that those go calls return immediately, so they they are not finished, and your control goes in here. Um, so if you have any code which reads from a channel, like as as I was explaining. Uh, before so if I am trying to let's say I'm trying to read from finished uh, chances are this line of code will be executed even before any of those threads are started and then it will blow up right so for example if I because logically what I'm doing here I'm, I'm doing wait for this to finish uh, because this consumes all the um, uh, control entries into the uh, the finished channel. Um, so if I, uh, you know, logically if I uh, comment that block that deadline out and I move it here, it will be doing the same thing. I have to block here and when and wait until all go routines finished processing and they push this boolean true like they do this line of code. Right? I need to wait for that. That they they've done this. They've push pushed true to my end uh, like control uh, channel. So whether I'm waiting here or whether I'm waiting here shouldn't matter. But look, if I run this code, uh, it will blow every single time. Uh, okay, not every single time, but uh, let's, let's do this again. So not blowing, not blowing, not blowing, blow. Not blowing, not blowing, blow. So it blows more frequently, right? Okay, um, the, uh, the, the thing is that those calls, of course, they take some time and this line gets executed quite quickly, like uh, before any of the producers, uh, writers into the, the channel kind of happen. So it's safer to not do that in the main thread, it's safer to do it in the go routine who has to start like this has to start and it will take some time and that's in gives a little bit of a, a time delay for those go routines to start as well um all right so uh that's it if you will have any questions uh post them on the uh, issue tracker if you are dealing with those sim simple primitive uh, pro uh problems use atomics or mutexes if you have a little bit more uh, elaborate, kind of a more um, 
uh, elaborate scenario where a little bit more synchronization is needed, usually channels work better. And as you've noticed, I don't need any synchronization, right? I'm doing this kind of unsafe adding uh, and my synchronization happens through passing data through channels. Uh, so that is the main, the main difference. Uh, and there are use cases where, where it works well. Uh, there is one more thing that I wanted to show you. Um, just give me a second. So I think I have it in the Firefox. Right, yes, this one. So there is a, um, some old code. Uh, I will post that link uh, into the lecture as well. There is a, an old question where the mutexes or go routines with the channels uh, are better uh, or faster. Um, and the code is a little bit old. It has been compiled with uh, Go uh, 1.12. Uh, so if I, I don't have the recent data, but the code is available uh, in um, Golang Play. Uh, but the data from the experiments suggest that um, Mutexes are faster, like uh, more than twice performance-wise, up to a certain point, up to a certain number of Go routines, and then their performance dramatically drops. Uh, so the performance of mutexes kind of gets so bad that uh, channels, uh, channel-based synchronization kind of is much better. And, also notice that the channel-based synchronization is more predictable across the board uh, in, a, in a number of Go routines. So it would be interesting to repeat the, uh, the, the, the play code with, and recompile it with uh, 117 and see if this characteristic stays. But it kind of demonstrates that in some use cases, it might be better to use channels, even in terms of performance. Uh, in our case, the performance for, of channels was worse, so we were still kind of in a in that range. Like we've been using thousand go routines, right? And that chart starts from two thousand five hundred. Um, and there has been uh, some work in relation to uh, different CPU architectures and how many um, processors you you configure, uh, and also in terms of uh, atomic atomic uh, writes and atomic reads. Um, so you can also see that um, atomics, uh, atomic write and reads are pretty killing everything, everything else. So mutexes and channels cannot compete uh, with uh, atomic writes and reads across, you know, across the board from, from zero, uh, from like a single, uh, go routine up to uh, 12 and a half thousand. So in terms of performance, Atomics is the uh, obvious winner. Why? Why is that? Well, as, as, you, as you've seen in the code, I have to use, sorry, uh, I have to use a certain function, certain uh, library function to achieve the synchronization. And because it is a library function, the language implementators can cheat. They can use certain specific uh, compiler optimizations to benefit from the platform uh, synchronization primitives to achieve very linear scaling. When I'm using mutexes, uh, you would think, well, the compiler should work it out. Why the compiler would not compile the same logic as with the atomic update? because I'm effectively doing the same thing. Yeah, the problem is the compiler cannot work it out and cannot use those kind of uh, low level primitives, which this function can. And that results in the in atomics being like, uh, you know, a clear performance winner. So every time you need to synchronize and every time you can use atomics, you should use atomics. Uh, and then between the channels and the mutexes, well, yeah, as we've seen on the previous chart, it depends. Like it seems in the low number of uh, Go routines, mutexes seem to be doing better. As you increase the number of Go routines, uh, mutexes are not as good as channels. Channels, again, are more optimized uh, for larger number of Go routines and they 
and they sort of win. So I will put those uh, uh, additional notes into the uh, into the wiki and as um as I've said, like if you have uh, a problem where you can use atomics, that's probably best to use atomics. If you have a problem where you can use go routines or mutexes, if you have a large number of go routines, probably go with channels. Um, all right, so that's it. Thank you very much, and um, sorry for making this lecture also a little bit longer than I was anticipating. Thank you.